Stabilizing. So perhaps let's um, let's get started. Uh, it's twelve oh four. Um, so jumping uh, jumping in, um, uh, Tom and I. My, my name's uh, Ilya. Tom and I will be talking through um, building actual demand forecasting systems, um, and uh, we will be Tom and I both. Um, development, uh, uh, so sort of the foundational machine learning research and then and then building that into um, into products. So um, uh, feel free to uh, in the Q&A, uh, uh, which you can sort of post questions into throughout the talk, um, put in very technical questions if you like. Uh, but this talk will be um, because we kind of have to cover um, uh, quite a bit of you know different technologies and different solutions um, in order to get a kind of holistic picture of how to do um, actionable demand forecasting. This will be a little bit a uh, little bit high level, um, still a tech talk, but uh, uh, please do ask questions if you'd like more more detail. Um, on that note, Q and A, fifteen minutes at the end of the talk. If we uh, if we do a good job of time management. Um, uh, yeah, well, with that said, um, let me jump in. Uh, so I'll do a uh, kind of lightning intro faculty uh, and then a slight more verbose uh, discussion of, of sort of our, our vision for this type of thing. Um, but uh, sort of uh, uh, initially uh, faculty is a, um, uh, an applied AI company and, and, and applied AI is, is kind of all we do. Um, and, uh, and we do a lot of it. Um, uh, I think that's basically all I want to say uh, in terms of faculty at a high level, but to give you more of an idea of how we, um, the type of work we do and how we think about these things, uh, the first kind of section in, 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 in uh, this discussion is, is actually meant to be um, a sort of a vision of what the, what the uh, end state might look like um, for how AI will uh, likely provide the sort of the most amount or the, the, the broadest uh, amount of impact uh, within the economy. So I think that'll uh, be a, 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 a sort of a nice um, intro to faculty in itself. Uh, and then from there, we'll zoom in to uh, likely where, um, where the most movement in this sort of um, uh, uh, direction will be in the short term, and that's around demand forecasting and, and, and operational planning. Um, so we'll talk about the kind of the, the current state, um, some of the uh, fairly significant challenges in that current state, and then um, uh, how to how to solve those um, how to solve those challenges. So, uh, uh, getting into um, to the sort of faculty vision for these things uh, is basically uh, we think uh, certainly I think that uh, AI is the transformational technology of our time. Um, and that uh, uh, AI will drive a um, uh, basically a, a paradigm shift in how we think about core business problems. Um, and so uh, this is a slightly different statement than, than some of the sort of uh, potentially uh, hypey grand claims that AI made. I'm saying here, core business problems, like how you interact with your customers, how you manage resources, how organizations allocate and invest cash, um, uh, as, as well as um, so they kind of manage their uh, their employees. Um, uh, that is different from, you know, beating esoteric board games, uh, folding proteins, uh, translating languages, which are all really exciting applications, uh, uh, applications of AI, um, but, uh, you know, uh, a little bit more narrow. Um, so just to, to, to kind of bring this to life a little bit, um, a little bit more, um, for example, interacting with customers, uh, uh, you know, uh, a, a, an organization could, uh, using using machine learning, um, have their their touch points optimized for the the incremental impact, so for the the causality. Um, in terms of managing resources, you can actually start to build really tight connections between um, strategic objectives. Uh, and uh, and the kind of the, the detailed granular operations of of the business, um, uh, you know, uh, in, in terms of sort of finance, uh, low 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 overhead, uh, real time reporting, uh, enabling flexible react uh, flexibility to react to disruptions uh, is very different than the the, the current state of um, uh, quarterly uh, you know financial planning and and, and reporting and 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 basically. Um, reacting on those types of timescales. Um, 
and and uh, finally, uh, you know, high performing agile workforce uh, tackling foreseen priorities um, is is a potential future state. Um, and and actually, uh, going outside of these kind of main um, business functions, uh, you can you can imagine uh, optimization algorithms kind of discovering uh, the best. Uh, set of actions or the best strategies um, uh, that basically uh, uh, exist across across these silos. Um, so you can have a, a basically a, a, a much more uh, much more efficient, much more uh, optimal um, organization, or you know, an an, an intelligent um, organization. Um, and so we we certainly want to uh, help you know every organization be able to to, to make this. Um, make this paradigm shift, um, but uh, that paradigm shift might take you know not one to two years. It might take one to two decades uh, for some uh, for some types uh, of uh, of businesses. Uh, and we certainly um, we certainly you know ha have some historical uh, it's a historical context for this, like the the transition from from steam energy to electricity actually took like a generation. To uh, to show up in as like a, a, a sort of step change in much much longer, and we will all think uh, um, uh, think it did when you kind of really look back uh, at it. Um, so. Uh, so this is um, so this is kind of the the, the long the long game. But uh, one area that's really ripe for disruption, uh, kind of uh, almost immediately, um, is uh, kind of operational planning, or uh, and in particular demand forecasting and planning. Um, so that's where um, where we uh, want to start, and the kind of the context uh, for this for this talk. Um, so let me uh, let me get into the kind of current state, uh, the current state of demand forecasting and and, and planning. Um, I think interestingly for, for for those of you who sort of aren't in um, kind of it, uh, uh, at the coal face on on uh, uh, on this um, on this 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 domain. I the three main uh, buckets uh, of reasons for that, but basically, you know, forecasts and 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 models and their kind of ensuing plans uh, tend to be just built on really really poor performance. Um, be because of that and a few other reasons, uh, operators just tend to have kind of very low confidence in any of the um, basically the technical solutions and 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 often tend to go at it very manually. Um, and then uh, you know, bringing that all together and including the fact that one of the kind of reactions to you know, the technical solutions not being trusted, siloing, you get kind of very reactive decision making within organizations. Um, and in, uh, in a little more detail, uh, the poor performance, the way it kind of manifests itself, uh, or, 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 you know, rather sh shows up is, um, uh, you know, a lot of simple averages, um, they tend to be very reliant on like a single data source. Uh, so if you're trying to forecast uh, the, the demand for uh, one of your products, you know, usually the data that goes into that forecast is the historical demand for that product only, rather than um, the sort of uh, the, the, the many other um, signals that you could have like, uh, you know, weather, macro, um, uh, macroeconomic data, competitor data, your other products, um, uh, et cetera. Um, and then, and then finally, you know, these, 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 you know, even if you could create sort of high performing forecasts at a, at an aggregate level, the operational decisions are like, where do I put a, you know, 32 by 32 stone wash, you know, Levi's 511, uh, in, uh, in which warehouse in order to, At that level, they tend to be very far from the sufficient amount of granularity. Um, and the, uh, we have a series of uh, quotes that can sort of, I think, best be described as uh, statements of despair. Um, but you, you basically, um, um, we hear things like, you know, you just do the best you can with what you've got. You know, sort of, um, 
not not really going to take these forecasts particularly seriously. Um, uh, and and you might wonder, um, just to get uh, technical for a second, you might you might wonder why um, why why like you know isn't there a, an open source package uh, for that? Uh, like that tends to be. Uh, the case in, in, in most other uh, of these kind of mod modeling applications, um, and there's there's a few subtleties um, actually. Uh, so 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 one just sort of observation along. Same way that computer vision and, and NLP. Um, uh, one of, uh, I, I think the, the reasons for that are what, one of the kind of core challenges um, uh, of forecasting is that it's, it's, it's an extrapolation problem, not an interpolation problem. So, you know, if you think of these amazing revolutions in deep learning, uh, uh, like, you know, very, very deep skip connection convolutional neural networks uh, can do an incredible job at object recognition or, 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 or image classification. Um, you know, and, and just to be a little bit of a caricature, you know, like classic, uh, imagine you're trying to predict, uh, like the, you're trying to classify uh, dogs versus cats. Uh, and you, you've got like millions of images of dogs and cats and, uh, and you get a new image of a dog. Um, Whereas forecasting, you're sort of extrapolation, extrapolating out into the future. Um, and I think the, the dog cats uh, sort of tenuous analogy would be you sort of, you know, train your dogs versus cats classifier, and then you like give it a picture of a camel and say, what's this? Um, so it's, a, it's, it's kind of a, a, a fundamentally um, different and harder problem. And, and that's why it tends to favor simpler and more, more bespoke statistical models. Um, and uh, to sort of make matters worse, uh, time series data often, you know, comes in much smaller quantities um, because, you know, you don't really care about what happened five years ago when you're trying to predict next week. Um, so you've got sort of a, a, a look back window that tends to be a little bit. Uh, like long-term seasonal effects. Um, so if you want to predict what's going to happen um, over Easter weekend, you know, this year, uh, uh, you, might, you might need uh, Easter weekend last year, except Easter weekend last year was like hard lockdown. So that's not really relevant. So what about Easter weekend the year before? Um, but that's already two years ago. Uh, and so you're sort of talking about uh, very little data. Um, in terms of learning, uh, learning um, statistical trends. Um, so it's not as easy as just grabbing the most recent open source package. Um, uh, moving, moving along on, the, uh, on this sort of second uh, uh, challenge is uh, that of low confidence. Um, so uh, often, you know, like, uh, forecasts, um, you know, often the, the things that you, uh, the decision that you need to make or the level that you need to operate at um, just means you've got a huge amount of volatility um, in, in, in your data. Um, so, you know, forecasts on like over massively volatile uh, 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 problems are, you know, just tend to be uh, wrong uh, much more often, um, uh, which we can, we can kind of talk about. Uh, uh, I would claim that it's just irrelevant to talk about kind of a point level forecast and you want to talk about uncertainty intervals and so on. Um, similarly, operators aren't statisticians, so they are always wanting to know like, you know, where did this forecast come from? Um, and uh, and to make to make matters worse, uh, you know, they'll, they'll uh, uh, an, an operator will have a forecast of what, you know, some forecaster said, and uh, you know, to from their supply chain or something, and these things will not really be consistent, and you know, you won't really know which one um, uh, which one to trust. Um, and again, uh, uh, whoops, uh, again, just sort of saying, well, surely there are some sort of no-brainer technical solutions to this. Um, I mean, th there are some. So this too much noise 
to be operationally useful point, um, you might say, well, why not use Bayesian statistics where you get the sort of the full, um, the full posterior. So you have like a probability distribution of what might happen. Um, uh, and yes, uh, that is a good idea, but you know, those come at um, a cost, in, in, in one of which being a computational cost. Um, and uh, if you try to not, not use Bayesian methods, you know, these sort of post hoc uncertainty estimates tend to be um, pretty, pretty limited. Testing it. Um, it's very appropriate to use um, to use simple statistical models. So aren't those just interpretable? Why 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 do people not understand the forecast? Um, and even these like linear um, uh, time series models like uh, ARIMA or or, um, uh, or Ceramax or whatever uh, they 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 tend to be sort of moving average combinations of what happened in the past to predict what happens sort of tomorrow and then. Um, like auto regressively applied to the future, um, or even worse, they're like based on differences, uh, uh, or even worse, they're based on differences over like seasonalities. So like, what what's the difference between last Monday and this Monday? And I'll use that to predict uh, to predict next Monday. Um, and so even a, often these linear models aren't actually um, easy to. You might say, well, why use great sort of explainability stuff that, you know, the, use the chat package or something. Um, but time series explainability is, is, um, is just much more subtle uh, than sort of standard, than standard explainability. Um, so, so again, uh, these things are, uh, are, 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 are sort of uh, not as easy as they, as they sound. Um, so I'll just yeah, I'll, I'll I'll quickly go through the reactive decisions. Um, this one is a little bit different. The sort of your intuition might uh, isn't quite the like. Well, isn't there an open source package for this? The, the problem here tends to be that um, to overcome some of the issues that we just talked about, organizations tend to sort of silo up so that an individual or a team can actually reason with their like. A problem of silos. Um, so you can, for example, no longer like know what assumptions every every silo is making. Um, uh, so you can't sort of stress test them. And uh, because people are doing this siloed and very manually, like nobody has any time um, to uh, get ahead and and to to build any flexibility into um, into uh, the sort of operational processes. Um, and so the the, the thing that's hard technologically here is um, is this kind of uh, this kind of inconvenient duality, um, which is you you require for the reasons I sort of already talked through, you require um, kind of deep R and D and product investment to to overcome the sort of explainability. Um, uh, how do I do these in a production environment where I like need my forecasts on time uh, every day or whatever it is. Um, so there's a lot of uh, sort of capital intense R&D product development work to do. But then you also to overcome these sort of silo and organizational problems, you need the ability to bring that technology together with you know, bespoke model design and, and, and integration um, into complex organizations so that the, the tech um, kind of lives where the operators need it to live. Um, uh, so it's kind of built into processes and, and, and also, you know, you turn your Bayesian posterior into a um, number of you know, units that we should store in this, um, uh, uh, in this, Uh, uh, um, uh, a, a challenge for any organization that's trying to do this because usually, you know, organizations that do deep R&D and product investment well, like, you know, AWS or Microsoft or Google, like can't do this um, and, and, and kind of vice versa.
So I will um, uh, pass it pass it over to Tom, but just to quickly conclude um, the kind of the current state. To, well, to overcome the current state, um, we need uh, you know we need state of the art forecasting performance. We need those forecasts and and models to be um, trusted by uh, a largely non-technical users. Um, and those need to be basically built into um, business processes and, and, and uh, objectives uh, uh, in order to support proactive. Um, uh, now let's talk about how to actually um, overcome those things. Cool. Uh, thanks, Ilya. Um, apologies to those of you who were reporting the unstable connection. Hopefully, I'll have a bit more luck. Um, let me just see if I can seamlessly take control here. Uh, there we go. Okay, great. So, um, yeah, I'm going to talk a bit about how we um, approach building demand forecasting systems um, at faculty. Uh, keeping in mind everything that uh, Ilya kind of just talked about. So obviously, as Ilya said, we want to use an approach where we can expect good performance, uh, and I'll discuss in some detail why uh, accurate predictions alone aren't enough. Uh, but they are clearly an important component. If you have the wrong idea of what might happen in the future, your plans and your decisions are probably going to be going to be off. Um, so the, the next thing that we, we care about is making sure that the, the predictions are trusted. So if end users and decision makers don't trust the predictions, uh, they'll be reluctant to act on them and we won't be able to kind of reap the benefits of accurate forecasts. And then finally, just to re-emphasize Ilya's kind of integration point and the, the need for proactive decisions. Um, like the forecasts need to be available in the right places. They need to be available at the right time to the kind of key decision makers. Uh, but also crucially, we need to be able to translate mathematical forecasts into decisions uh, by finding a way to relate them to our kind of business objectives. Uh, come on, having a bit of, oh, there we go. Uh, problems advancing the slides, sorry about that. Okay, so to give you an overview, uh, all of these kind of considerations that we've been talking about have led us to a framework and like a set of tools that combines multiple key components. So first of all, uh, we've decided that our preferred modeling approach is uh, ooh, is uh, Bayesian hierarchical uh, models. Uh, now our colleague Omar gave a tech talk on these last month. You can find that on our YouTube channel if you want to catch up on, on these in, in a lot more detail. Uh, for the purposes of this talk, uh, it's kind of enough to understand that uh, first of all, Bayesian inference uh, uses probability distributions to kind of represent our knowledge about uh, parameters and quantities that we care about. And we use observed data to refine that knowledge. So crucially, because we're representing our knowledge, uh, we can allow experts, uh, domain experts, to feed into that initial representation of our knowledge. And so we can incorporate domain knowledge into our models uh, directly. Another key attribute that um, these approaches have is that they produce a full distribution of predictions, not just a single prediction. And this distribution kind of captures the spread of possible outcomes uh, and hence how uncertain we are in the prediction we're making. And we'll see this in more detail shortly as well. Uh, hierarchical models, so that's Bayesian inference, but hierarchical models, uh, they're well suited to hierarchical data or more generally just sort of categorical data. And what they do is they produce estimates for a particular group in your data by balancing what they learn from the data as a whole with what they learn from the data for that particular group. And they can be a useful tool for overcoming sort of low data, uh, low data issues that might arise. So the second key component in our, in our approach is explainability. Um, so faculties developed extensions to the Shapley value framework uh, for machine learning explainability. Uh, that allows users to incorporate causal knowledge into explanations. And in the context of time series modeling, there's a very natural causal structure simply because events in the future can't cause events in the past. And we can exploit that uh, structure to produce explanations that align very naturally with our kind of intuitive understanding of how forecasts should be updated when new information comes in. 
So another core component to the approach is sort of automated uh, pipeline monitoring. Uh, we've got a number of pre-built dashboards uh, designed primarily for sort of technical users and the data scientists developing these models uh, that can be used to check the uh, say overnight model runs uh, completed correctly, for example, and that diagnostic metrics are in reasonable ranges. And finally, and this is in some sense less a kind of component of the approach so much like a core objective that we prioritize, but we want to ensure deep integration into existing processes so that the forecasts are available to decision makers uh, when they need them. And so together, all of these components form a kind of holistic approach to building uh, demand forecasting systems uh, that really emphasizes and prioritizes, has as an end goal, uh, producing like actionable forecasts that actually get used. Uh, so we're gonna talk about how all of this kind of comes together. And we're gonna use as a case study or like a running example, um, some work we've done over the last 18 months during the pandemic with the NHS. So everything we're talking about here isn't purely theoretical. Uh, in fact, these ideas uh, were kind of developed and battle tested uh, on this project and others um, in, in recent years. So let me just explain a little bit about what the work we did with the NHS was about. So we worked with um, NHS England and NHS Improvement on this COVID-19 early warning system. And what it does is it forecasts COVID cases at a local level across the country, which allows uh, decision makers to have a very clear view of likely demand for, for beds, uh, first and foremost, also things like ventilators and PPE. And one of the key things they wanted to use this for was to, um, to do planning around uh, elective care um, during uh, peaks in, in the various waves we experienced. Um, so, the baseline we were competing against early on in the pandemic, uh, essentially all elective care was canceled and capacity was reserved for COVID cases. So the baseline was no elective care is happening. And as it turns out over the last 18 months, uh, for, for long stretches of time, that approach was, was much too conservative. There was essentially like poor utilization of the full capacity. So there's plenty of scope here for accurate forecasts um, to ensure much more efficient use of uh, resources. And in the case of the NHS, that can literally mean, you know, saving lives. So we're gonna, we're gonna show how all of these components we've been talking about came together on, on this particular example. Uh, so if I can advance a slide, there we go. So first of all, let's talk about um, performance and why we expect that we can achieve good performance with these Bayesian hierarchical models. So there's a few different reasons that feed into this. So first of all, is the fact that we can incorporate uh, expert knowledge into the model. And this can be very useful for constraining the model in useful ways to prevent like totally wild extrapolation. Uh, as Ilya said, one of the reasons time series models are, are hard or time series modeling is hard is because fundamentally it is an extrapolation problem rather than an in interpolation problem. A lot of sort of classification and regression problems are really about interpolating, whereas time series forecasting is extrapolating. Um, which is sort of much less constrained and hence much harder to do. Um, so another, another key component of this is that when we build Bayesian models, we're really specifying like a generative model of the data and we have the flexibility to tailor that model very closely to the, um, to the use case and uh, capture the dynamics uh, of the data with the functional form that we choose. And we can actually specify precisely how different leading indicators and features that we might have access to should feed into the model and what they should influence and how they should influence those things. And finally, uh, as we've said a couple of times already, the hierarchical, uh, the hierarchical modeling approach uh, allows us to make like high quality forecasts at a really granular level. So on the left, oh, there we go. Uh, didn't show up for me for a second. Uh, you should see a number of plots. Um, which kind of illustrate these points. So first of all, uh, what we're looking at is um, predictions of number of cases in three different hospitals uh, during like a single wave uh, in the pandemic. Uh, and and this, this graph is from uh, like the model development stage rather than uh, from the actual deployed dashboard. You'll see plenty of screenshots of that um, uh, later. But I want to call out a few different things. 
first of all, you'll see that the, the kind of prediction corresponding to the purple line in the middle is, is tracking the, um, the growth and uh, decline in number of cases uh, very well. And this is really because we're able to take all of this knowledge that we have about um, epidemiology and pandemics and how viruses spread through a population and actually build them into the model in two different ways. One is by constraining parameters uh, to be in plausible ranges. So we know, for example, uh, like what the realistic range for reproduction rates of a, a virus are. We know things that like, uh, it's very unlikely that the entire population contracts the virus within a week. So building in even these relatively unopinionated, that's not, um, that's not a very constraining uh, assumption that we're making that we can't go from zero to 100% of the population infected in a week. Building simple uh, constraints into the model like that really help us control predictions um, and make sure that we don't start predicting something completely wild. Um, now, uh, just as a side note, a criticism that is often leveled against uh, Bayesian inference is that you're kind of biasing your predictions with these subjective assumptions. But our argument is that, um, you know, building knowledge in in this way is not really any more subjective than assuming, for example, a linear model for, for your data or something like that. And often, like I say, we're not trying to input the answers themselves. We're just trying to rule out obviously physically impossible scenarios or rule out infinities is another way you can think of it. So the other like key component here is that because we know about the dynamics of disease spread, you know, the cumulative number of cases often follows these sort of logistic style curves. Uh, we can tailor the functional form that we're fitting to the, to the data to kind of match that. And so um, in hospital one, you'll notice that we observe most of the full wave, uh, you can see that the blue points correspond to observed data and then the, the gray points correspond to uh, subsequently observed data that wasn't seen by the model. Uh, so in hospital one, we, we observe like the up and down. Hospital two, uh, we're only really seeing the, the upward trend. Uh, and then in hospital three, we've only observed four data points and almost all of them correspond to roughly zero, uh, zero cases. Um, but because we know about how these will turn over and how they will decline and uh, fade out, we, we actually have a way of like extrapolating that trend into the future once we've kind of fit these curves, uh, curves to the data. And I'll, I'll particularly emphasize hospital three. With those four data points, all of which are close to zero, you really, by itself, you wouldn't be able to make a useful prediction. But this is where the hierarchical modeling is coming in by looking at all of the data collectively, the model has learned something about how intense this particular wave is, uh, like how variable the location of the peak is and, and so on. And it's able to come up with a, a pretty good prediction of how, um, uh, how this is likely to play out in this particular hospital, although note the sort of wider uncertainty than you have in the other two predictions, uh, despite only having access to those four data points. And this problem of dealing with like very limited or missing data at the trust level was actually a major concern of the NHS early on in the pandemic, to the extent that they believe that forecasting at the like the trust level or the hospital level was was impossible. Um, so so they essentially were delighted when uh, we were able to overcome these challenges using these modeling approaches. So uh, on to um, the sort of trust issues. Um, as we said earlier, uh, we want people to act on these forecasts, use them to make decisions, and that requires trust. So there's three ways we try to build trust with end users. First, explanations, as Ilya, um, as Ilya mentioned. If users understand how and why a model came to its conclusions, they're more likely to accept that the predictions are reasonable and hence make decisions on the basis of those predictions. Um, secondly, confidence intervals uh, enable action under uncertainty. Um, by the way, I'm aware there's a slight termina, sort of terminology ab abuse happening here. Confidence intervals aren't really a Bayesian concept, but we're just gonna run with that for the purposes of this talk. Um, but anyway, they, they capture the, the spread in um, what might actually happen, like how much could the true observation deviate from the prediction that we make, uh, which is important information uh, that needs to be included in, in planning uh, rather than just like the single prediction value. 
Uh, and finally, uh, we aim for full transparency in our performance tracking. So we want to actually show users how good were our forecasts in the past so that um, when we give them a new set of forecasts uh, that relate to as yet unobserved data, they have the confidence to, to trust that they'll be accurate. So let me show you how each of these things uh, looks on the actual uh, deployed early warning system uh, that we built for the NHS. So we'll start with um, the explainability. I don't know how readable this will be on, on your screens, but what you're looking at is, first of all, at the top, a graph which shows uh, how we expect cases to kind of rise in a particular trust. And then underneath the table is listing the multiple sources of data that were fed into the model and explains how much each of them affected the prediction and in what direction. And it, uh, just to, to help uh, sort of non-technical users, we add this um, interpretation in sort of human readable text. And so you can see that uh, in this case, um, the number of cases uh, three weeks ago was actually uh, the most important um, the most important feature, which is essentially because that was already setting us on a, a trajectory that kind of inevitably would meant like uh, would mean an increase in cases. And we've got various other features and their importance below. Um, so we've we found this to be absolutely critical uh, on the NHS project because uh, you know this this component of the model came came after we already had a first set of serviceable forecasts being made. And there was definitely, uh, you know, some, some hesitancy to, to just accept the, the forecast at face value, just because there's so much at stake. You know, if you get something wrong, uh, you wanna be absolutely sure of the decisions you're making. So just helping people understand how we're coming to the conclusions that we make and they can kind of sense check those predictions uh, really helped um, people sort of buy into the forecast we were making. Uh, whoops, I've advanced one slide too many. If I go back one. Yes, yeah, so um, here are the way we display forecasts in the tool to uh, the users. And you'll see the predictions in purple on the right there um, correspond to the actual forecasts themselves. And uh, we attach these kind of confidence intervals uh, to show how much um, those predictions could vary. And in this case, they kind of correspond to the you can interpret them as like best case scenarios and worst case scenarios for the, the growth in infections over time. Uh, and then finally, um, let me show you the performance tracking that we do. So this is actually shown to the end users and it shows um, a number of uh, things about how accurate our forecasts were in the past. So the, the top the, the top graph here will take a little bit of explaining, but I think it's it's well worth it. So um, for each prediction we make, like I say, we're, we're adding these confidence intervals, which try to capture how much the, the prediction could vary, uh, sorry, the observed data could vary relative to the, the prediction we make. And what we're showing on that scatter plot are, um, first of all, you see the bands, they correspond to the confidence intervals. And then the blue dots correspond to where uh, observed data landed in the confidence intervals that we predicted over time. Uh, so you can see uh, there's like a good spread over those confidence intervals. And then underneath the bars show you what proportion of data fell into different confidence intervals. So first of all, what proportion fell in the 50% confidence interval? What proportion fell in the 85%? What proportion fell in the 95%? Oh, sorry, 80% and 95%. Uh, and, and what we can see from those bars is actually these confidence intervals are very well calibrated. When we say there is a 50% chance that the true data will fall in this range, approximately 50% of the true observations do fall in that range, similarly for the 80% and 95%. So what this means is those intervals can actually be used to make probabilistic statements about what might happen in the future. And that's just a, a really useful um, component uh, for decision making, as we'll see in a second, but also for, for building trust. The, the kind of time series plot underneath that has these multiple fanning out um, regions overlaid. This is showing uh, what we predicted in the past overlaid on how the data actually played out. So each one of those, those shapes, um, it was produced, generated, it's a prediction generated with only data that came before kind of the start of that shape, if that makes sense. So basically what we're showing with this graph is that when we predict these intervals, 
the data is actually kind of consistency consistently landing in those um, in in those regions. So users, they don't have to worry that, you know, we're changing our predictions over time to kind of like match the data. They can actually go and see, okay, you predicted this four weeks ago, how did it actually play out? Uh, and when they see this, uh, they trust the predictions we make in the future are, are likely to, to be accurate and well calibrated also. Uh, great, so let's finally uh, talk about decision-making. So this one is quite broad. Um, and uh, there's, a, there's a number of components that, that feed into making sure that we actually make sort of proactive and, and good decisions on the basis of these forecasts. Um, a lot of the challenges to solve here um, revolve around kind of infrastructure and integration. So I mentioned a couple of times already the importance of having predictions available and easily accessible to end users so they can kind of see the predictions in a timely manner and act on them accordingly. Um, but then there are also things like if we want to iterate on the model, we, we don't want to have to go through some very manual process of trying some new assumptions and, uh, and then like very manually analyzing the results. Ideally, we'd have like a nice pipeline set up where we can tweak our model and then just run it and then have everything kind of aggregated into our, our dashboard so we can see how, how things panned out. Um, those are both important uh, components. Uh, I'm going to focus on this last bullet point I have on the right there, the precise codification of strategic targets. So let me explain a little bit what I mean by that um, using the following slides. So on the top, we have another one of our forecasts and um, we have the kind of confidence intervals that we're predicting, the kind of possible spread of, um, of uh, what the actual values might be once the data comes in. Uh, and then underneath we're uh, kind of visualizing what could happen with these histograms. So on the left, you'll see that a traditional forecast, it generally corresponds to like a single number and that number will be, will be wrong for the most part. So if we predict 30 patients are gonna be admitted tomorrow, um, it's actually less likely to be exactly 30 than it is to be some other number, although hopefully the number will be close to 30. But that's what I'm representing on the right with this histogram. So we predict 30, but there's, a, there's always a spread, some like amount of noise uh, around 30 uh, that correspond to the, the different values, the different numbers of patients that might actually be admitted. So what's the kind of upshot of this? Well, if we look at the histograms at the bottom now, if we were to predict or plan for 30 patients uh, and you know 30 is the average, that means 50% of the time we'll see more than 30, more than 30 patients coming in. And if our objective is to um, have like a very high chance of having enough beds available for all of the patients that come in, then a 50% chance that we don't have enough beds just isn't good enough. So actually, uh, what we care about is having a high chance of having enough capacity for everybody that, that comes into the hospital, for everybody that's admitted to the hospital on a particular day. So this is where having, the, having access to the full kind of distribution of predictions becomes really useful uh, because we can instead predict at the 95% uh, quantile. And as we saw with these well-calibrated forecasts, that literally means uh, reserving this number of beds means you have a 95% chance you'll have uh, enough beds for everyone tomorrow. Um, but we can even go a bit further than this. So uh, in the case of uh, reserving beds in, um, in wards, we have a little bit of flexibility. So it's actually okay that if you, if you make a person wait a day for an extra bed, say. So in this case, we can, we can further adjust our objective we don't necessarily need uh, to have a bed for everybody on every single day. We just need to make sure that we have a bed for them within some time window, which uh, can be determined according to you know, uh, the experts at the hospital. And what that corresponds to is rather than having, uh, rather than looking at the patients admitted on a particular day, maybe we care about the average number of patients uh, admitted over like a, a short time window. And generally, whenever you start taking averages, your uncertainty starts shrinking. So uh, if you now look again at the histogram on the bottom at the left, 
uh, the average number of patients uh, over a time window is less variable, which means predicting at 40, like we were before, 40 patients admitted, means uh, you're actually still being a bit too conservative. Uh, so instead, if we shift to the 95th uh, kind of percentile um, in the, for the average, uh, we can get the same kind of theoretical guarantees that there's a 95% chance we'll have enough capacity for, for anybody um, being admitted over some time period. Um, but we're freeing up, we're freeing up beds by going from 40, 40 beds reserved to 35 beds reserved. That's an extra five beds that can be allocated to elective care, which means more people are getting uh, the health care they need rather than just um, people uh, that have contracted coronavirus. So hopefully that helps you understand how this extra information of like the full uncertainty in your predictions can feed into kind of complex and well-optimized uh, decision-making processes. Okay, so that about wraps it up for the stuff we wanted to talk about today. So just for, a, uh, let me quickly summarize the things we talked about and then we'll throw to, throw to questions. So our goal is fundamentally to make forecasts that are both actionable and actually used, and that requires solving multiple problems. Um, clearly, we need well-performing uh, forecasts. If we predict the wrong thing is gonna happen, then uh, it's hard to make useful or good plans or um, decisions on the basis of those. But then there are also kind of operational challenges to make sure that this stuff is actually useful. Uh, key to that is building trust with end users. They don't trust it, they won't act on it. And you could have a really great performing model, but if nobody's actually using it, then it kind of doesn't matter. It's like the tree falling in the woods with no one to hear it. Um, but then also there's another key step, which is translating forecasts. A forecast by itself is a prediction of what might happen. It doesn't actually tell you what to do. And often what we really care about is what do I need to do in order to achieve my objectives? And so there's many things that we need to do to ensure that business objectives can be mapped onto, onto forecasts. Um, so that's like the, the third key component that, that we kind of care about. Okay, so great. Um, thank you very much for your attention. We have about nine minutes and I've seen there's a few questions coming in. So we'll do our best to uh, address all of them. And if you have more questions, please do put them in the QA as we go. Uh, okay, so we have a question. Um, how easy was it to explain confidence intervals to the users? Um, and did we find helpful ways of conveying the idea? Um, so, well, maybe I'll say one thing to begin with, but Ilya had a lot of involvement in explaining this to uh, people at the NHS, so I'll let him take over in a second. But one thing that I think is important here is that, as I mentioned, uh, what I was describing as confidence interval isn't actually technically the statistical definition of a confidence interval. And what we mean is actually the thing that most people assume you mean when you say confidence interval. So it actually maps like quite naturally onto your intuition for like this region has a certain probability of containing the true, true answer. But I'll let Ilya take over on uh, the specifics of how we explain that to the client. Thanks, Tom. Um, and by the way, apologies everyone for the, uh, the connectivity issues, which I can't tell if you're experiencing right now. So maybe it's not that useful for me to respond to these, but I, the, the short answer is Sorry, Amir, your laptop has perfect comic timing. It cut out immediately after I, you said the short I apologize. answer. Is. Oh, okay. okay. Well, I assume I'm back now, right? You are back now, yeah. but we missed the, the whole the, answer. The short answer is unlike Tom belaboring credibility intervals and confidence intervals and so on, we, we just talked about um, sort of, you, you don't know what's gonna happen. That noise, if you, that data, if you look at it carefully, it is really noisy. And so people understand that, you know, the next day you might get a really surprising number. Um, and so we, we just sort of communicated it and, uh, you know, 50% of the time, the data is gonna land within those 50% those bands, the sort of dark purple and you know, left it at that sort of notion of calibration rather than kind of belabored any, any like mathematical version um, of that. Cool, thanks. Sorry, I'm having a bit of a window nightmare uh, here. Um, 
Okay, so there was another question. Are you able to include future events into the forecasting model, uh, e.g. lockdown orders, mask policies, etc.? cetera? Uh, so yes, actually this did happen to an extent. Uh, you might be aware that a academic group in Oxford uh, built a simulator that um, basically like an agent-based model that tried to, to get a sense of what impact things like lockdown orders, uh, mass policies, et cetera, would, um, would have on say the reproduction rate and so on. And um, we, uh, we used the outputs of that model. So we actually, we collaborated with them a little bit as well uh, on, on that model. We use the outputs of that model to inform like our priors in the in the Bayesian model. So you know uh, after a certain point, um, you know the reproduction rate is going to be affected by a lockdown order. So you can actually kind of build that into the model in the form of your priors. Um, I think it's fair to say though that wasn't necessarily um, a focus of us. Uh, we used a number of uh, what we call like leading indicators, such as um, mobility data from Google and the number of calls being made to um, services like 111, uh, that, um, people reporting that they had developed symptoms and so on, um, because we know that there's a, there's a kind of lag, people become symptomatic and then like if they develop se severe symptoms that will happen you know, some fixed number of days later with like some, some variability obviously. Um, so early reporting of symptoms is a really good predictor of how many people are going to end up in hospital in a, in a particular region. Um, was your Bayesian hierarchical modeling process written in-house or any there, are there any third party libraries you'd recommend? Uh, yeah, all, uh, well, so any, any like Bayesian model ends up being highly customized anyway, because you have to specify the kind of generative model of your data. Um, the, the model we built for the NHS uh, was built using STAN and PyStAN, uh, which is kind of a general purpose um, Markov chain Monte Carlo sampler. So basically a tool for doing inference on Bayesian models, uh, if you're not so familiar with the space. Uh, these days we actually recommend, or well, we prefer a, a different library called NumPyro uh, for various reasons that are, it's probably not worth going into, but key among them is that it just is it, it is actually a, a, a Python library where Stan is kind of its own modeling language, which has these various wrappers to enable to use it from Python. Um, NumPyro has some like nice flexibility and is uh, built on some like pretty cool modern, uh, modern Python libraries like Jax uh, from Google and so on. Uh, oh, so there was another question, PyMC3 TensorFlow probability or something else. Uh, I've just answered that. So let me take off some of these questions. Um, <clears throat> Hi, could you elaborate on how you used hierarchical modeling to tackle the problem of granularity? So the problem of granularity can be restated essentially as one of not enough data. If you look at uh, just the data you have for a particular hospital in a particular week, that's going to be much less than all of the data you've collected on all COVID cases across the country. But clearly, the number of cases you have in any particular hospital is not totally independent of the number of cases you have elsewhere. So what you want is a way that combines uh, what you're learning from the data as a whole with what you observe in that particular hospital. And hierarchical models are just the right theoretical framework to achieve exactly this trade-off between like local estimates and global estimates. Uh, how much time do we have? Two, two more minutes. I'll try and get through as many as possible, but we might have to follow up with emails for some of these. Uh, how could you tackle the issue around poor slash low volume data? Bayes is only as good as its initial data. Um, I see. So um, I think partially answered by my previous, um, previous answer. So, well, Bayes generically can handle low volume data through the use of its priors. The priors, is, priors can like constrain wild inferences due to, to low volumes of data. So one way to set your priors is to like have expert knowledge fed in. And in some cases that's very possible. Uh, hierarchical models are effectively setting priors from the, the kind of global picture. That's one way to, to understand them. You're setting priors for like what's happening in a particular hospital. Uh, by looking at what happens across all of your hospitals. Um, 
and then part of the question was uh, where did we use any algorithms to produce initial synthetic data uh, yes as mentioned in a previous answer uh, we took some information from the the oxford simulator to to help us understand what were reasonable priors for different parameters i'm maybe a little bit ambitious given my connection am i yeah it's You're okay just right that, now yeah you, you can you can also convert your priors into epidemiological information like the r factor and so on and just like look up papers that were coming out at the time from wuhan and so on um so you, you can actually do quite a bit in terms of setting your priors reasonably um even before you had much data um got a question on measurement errors in the underlying data as an additional source of uncertainty um i guess there's a few challenges here. Um, first of all, uh, like the, the highest quality data is hospital admissions, whereas to some extent you care about like cases as a whole and there who gets tested, who is asymptomatic and so on, uh, lead to all kinds of um, issues there. Um, on the data quality point, even from the hospitals, uh, we had sort of like lots of missing data, lots of zeros. Um, we also saw these sort of weird weekly seasonal effects where reporting was kind of reduced over the weekend and then would suddenly flood in on Monday and so on. So it looked like things were spiking and people would panic, but actually it would be okay. Um, so, well, there's there's like all kinds of different things you need to do to address all of these. There's like five different questions there or something. Um, one thing maybe I'll just call out uh, is that by having a model which is effectively like fitting curves to your data, you're actually pretty robust against individual sort of missing data points. Whereas some statistical models such as um, Serima models and so on, they, they really require an observation at like regular time spaced intervals. So there are some modeling choices you can make that um, kind of help with some of those things. Um, I think we're over time. There's still a few questions that we, we didn't get to. So apologies for anyone who asked the question that, um, that we didn't have time for. Um, we'll follow up with an email. I believe we have the ability to send emails to everybody who was registered to this event and we'll try and get to as many of those as possible. Um, but thanks very much for attending. Uh, apologies for any technical issues along the way and um, enjoy the rest of your days. Thanks everyone. Thanks a lot.